flies back to St. Louis uh, this afternoon. Uh, we pray, Lord, as we open up the pages of 2 Samuel, we hear the uh, the story of David, uh, the great, great ancestor of, of your son, Jesus. We pray that uh, these words come to us uh, in a joyful expression of, of how you're sharing your message with us today uh, and how it leads us to the cross and to the promise of, of not only Jesus' life, death, resurrection, but also his ascension into heaven uh, just before telling us that he's going to return for us. And we find promise in that um, and that the words we hear today uh, give us strength in taking that message to a a world that desperately needs to hear your message, a world that desperately needs to come to Jesus uh, for peace and for salvation. All these things we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right. Any housekeeping issues before we uh, we continue on? Did Jim do okay last week? I mean, I heard a couple guys this morning were overwhelmingly happy with what Jim did. I would like to hear some complaints um, <laughs> because you always want, if somebody's filling in, you want them to do a good job, but not so good. And it was kind of overwhelming. So I, you know, there's that other side of me. It's, you know, so if you're out there, Jim, uh, thank you for filling in last week. Uh, all joking aside, I appreciate you. Love you. And it, uh, it's very comforting knowing that if something comes up, I can take off and you guys are, everybody's training. We're all training in here. That's what we're doing, uh, training on how to take the message to the world. And I appreciate it. And a bunch of you guys have raised your hands uh, and led, uh, led this class and other classes. And uh, I appreciate that. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big deal. So, all right. If there's nothing else, uh, here we are. We are in, uh, I had us at 2 Samuel chapter 5. I think we made it through verse 16. That's what I had, starting in verse 17. <clears throat> Does that sound right? Yeah. All right. Uh, getting us to that point, the first part of chapter 5. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. I still got the scratchy throat thing going on. Went and saw the doctor, and she checked everything, said, I'm in great shape. Lord knows, we went to um, Dominican Republic last week. And uh, for my nephew's wedding, I officiated that, and it was awesome. Uh, but, you know, tested before we go, and, you know, shoving that thing in there, and, and testing us. If you go out of the U.S., anybody who goes out of the U.S., when you come back in, within three days before coming back, you got to get it again. So I can assure you. This little scratch I got, I've been COVID tested enough times in the last two weeks. I ain't got COVID. So, uh, Lord knows I may have anything else, but I don't have COVID. But uh, anyway, I don't know what got me there. But uh, uh, chapter five, we had David, uh, who now has become, after seven years of being the king of Judah, now he has become the king of all Israel. Right. Uh, those uh, those jack wagons, the Jebusites were in Jerusalem and they were denigrating David and talking smack. And David basically walked in and told them, get out of the way. And that became Zion. And that is now the, the central hub of all Israel. Uh, I did make if you weren't here uh, back uh, in our last gathering. Uh, chapter 5, verse 10. I think that really is the pivotal. If you're a guy like me where your your Bible is all written up, I don't know if you can see it out there. It's a train wreck in here. But uh, this is the living Bible. Some people are, don't write anything in their Bibles because they, uh, you know, they want to keep it in its purest form. I get it, and I respect that. To me, the Bible is a tool. It's It contains the Lord's Word, uh, but I right all over it because it helps enrich my relationship with the Lord as I'm reading and interpreting and, and going over and over and over it. But if you're one of these people who read or write in the book like I do, uh, make a little note there, chapter, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 10, because that really, to me, that's the pivotal part of David's, that's the pivotal verse where we see a change in the air with David. He's 37 years old, 
And David is going up to this, up to 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 10. We're seeing the rise of David. You get to verse 10. Now we see the reign of David. R-E-I-G-N, not R-A-I-N, right? We're seeing the, now we have the reign of David and who he is as a king. And now we're going to see how, what, how does David handle this? You know, it's one thing to want to be the guy. Gentlemen, and at, I know a lot of you have held very high leadership positions and in different aspects of, of your vocations. It's one thing trying to be the guy or willing to be the guy. It's a whole nother thing when you're the guy, right? When you're the boss, now it's the, the, the math changes. How do you handle it? Some of you have probably seen guys that you've worked with and ladies. They weren't necessarily the greatest employee. They became a boss and they became really good. I've had a lot of these guys and, and they were really a good boss. Not such a good worker, but a good boss. I've also had a lot of really good guys that became the boss and what happened to you, right? They shelved their integrity. They shelved everything that got them there. And now they think they got to rewrite themselves and they become not very nice, right? They become maybe the bureaucrat kind of guy, right? So the question with David now is, okay, David now is, is there. He is the king of all Israel. How is he going to handle it? So, so that brings us to uh, verse 17. David now is uh, 37, 37 years old. Again, was the king of Judah for seven years. He will be the king of all Israel for another 33 years. And we got uh, his children there, starting in verse 14. <clears throat> and they got all their names listed out there. Uh, Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon. Those are all the sons of with Bathsheba. And she's not in the play yet. So we're saying this is how this is going to play out. Uh, Ibhar, Elishua, Nephig, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphet. Okay. So here we are. Verse 17. Any questions to this point? All right. Verse 17. Uh, would somebody want to read? I don't see a lot of hard names in there. Would somebody want to read 17 to the end of the chapter? Uh, through, was it verse 25? Just eight verses. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dick. All right. So here uh, we have David now. You, you, you sense a shift in the air, right? Uh, verse 17. Uh, when the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they all went up uh, 
the Phil, all the Philistines went up to search for David. They spread out uh, over the valley of the Rephaim. And they're, okay, we're going to take this guy on now, right? Again, they hated David. David went and fought Goliath, who was a Philistine, right? And then David came, and David was kind of had the outs with Saul. And so David was fighting with the Philistines. And they didn't like that, right? The, remember they told him he had to go home? He couldn't fight against Saul. They didn't trust him. <clears throat> well, now David's become the king of all of this. And they're saying, hey, we got to go after him, take him out. And uh, so what does David do? Uh, this is pretty interesting. Verse 19. And David inquired of the Lord. Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you give them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up, for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. David defeats them. And what does David say? He says in verse 20, the Lord has burst through my enemies before me like a bursting flood. Right? If we drop down to 23 or 22, the Philistines came again and spread. So they're going to try this again in the Valley of Rephaim. They didn't learn their lesson. So they're going to do it again. And David inquires of the Lord. Should we go after him? And what does the Lord say? No, you shall not go up, but go around to the rear. Come against them opposite the balsam trees. When you hear the sounds of uh, marching in the tops of the balsam trees, listen for that, David, then rouse yourself. For then the Lord, he's speaking in third person here, has gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. And David did it, and they wiped them out uh, from Geba to Gezer. That's it, about 20 mile, 20 mile run. So, so who's running things here? Yeah, right? We remember all the way back, the beginning of Samuel, right? When they were, the, they were, we want a king. All these other places have a king. We don't get a seat at the table. We got prophets. They got kings. We need to have a seat at the table. We need a king. <clears throat> the Lord says, fine, you can have a king. But here's how this is going to look. First of all, we're gonna, the king's going to take your guys and your sons and your daughters. We remember all that, right? And he said, but what you are as a king, you're like a small K king because I am still Yahweh. And if you look to me for all things, I will provide. King Saul started out, and how did he start out? Pretty good, right? I mean, he started out honoring, and, and then, again, it got a little testy, and he started doing, wanting to do things on his own. When the, uh, I think it was the Amalekites, were coming in to attack. Remember, they're like coming in and, and they had to have a sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord would provide, you know. But the prophet had to do the sacrifice, the prophet being Samuel. And as they're coming in, what did Saul do? He he did it. Why? He could do it because he was king. As the troops were coming around, the Amalekites were coming around. And uh, only the prophet can do the sacrifice. What was going on in Saul to why he did the sacrifice and he didn't wait for Samuel? He was kind of arrogant. He could do everything on his own, but he didn't really have to inquire. Yes, I think that's true. He was anointed as king, but he wasn't a prophet. The prophet and priest did the sacrifices. What happened to him that more than more than the bravado, as they're all coming around, and he's seeing all these guys everywhere, and he did the sacrifice quick. I don't think he was feeling necessarily bravado at that time. He was scared. 
He was scared. He was frightened. He was petrified. He saw all these guys coming. We're going to get wiped out. He does the sacrifice because he got scared. And so he took the matter in his own hands because God wasn't doing it quick enough for him. Right? And certainly the prophet wasn't. The prophet was probably out at racetrack getting himself a Diet Pepsi to start his day. Right? And Saul was, was scared. And so he did it. He did not trust in the prophet, the Lord's prophet, and he did not trust in the Lord. And the Lord said, therefore, the, the throne is going to go to the next one. Uh, you've, you've denigrated uh, this holy place. You've denigrated the very altar. And you did it because, yes, you're arrogant. And you thought you can do it. You don't have the authority to do that. Um, you know, we think when all else fails, I will do it, right? Uh, we all have that, that person in our lives that we want them to believe so much. You know, we all have that family member that just, they don't, they don't believe or they kind of do, but they really push it aside and <clears throat> we want them to believe. But our Lord says, pray to me. I will give you peace, but the Holy Spirit has to do that. We're called to plant seeds, but we can't make them believe, right? And that's a, we consider a curse sometimes, but it's a blessing. Because if we did have the ability to make people believe and they didn't believe, then it's on us. But that's, we don't have the, the authority to do that. We only have the authority and the command to plant seeds and to tell them about Jesus and to walk with them. But we can't make them believe. Questions on that? Thoughts? So here we have David. The Lord says, go. And uh, David goes and he says, don't go. Go around the side. The other point I was going to make on this was, not only does the Lord walk with David, but the Lord also gives him uh, strategy. So the Lord isn't just there with him. The Lord is, is directing his comings and his goings. Um, and I think as much as we in current day America don't see that so much, um, the Lord certainly directs our comings and goings. He opens doors for us, allows us to, um, to walk through them. And, you know, sometimes in our lives we're going in these wonderful hills. And sometimes, gentlemen and ladies, uh, we go through some really bad valleys, but uh, the Lord is always there walking and kind of directing us, uh, not like a puppet, but uh, certainly encouraging us uh, as we go along the way. Um, and he allows us to be put in positions of sharing his good news. And it is nothing short of a miracle to figure out how he does that sometimes. You know, it wasn't. 15 years ago, I'm going through the jungles of South America carrying an M16 with an M203 grenade launcher, chasing down drug traffickers and airplanes and being on clandestine airfields, laying in them for five days in the mud, coming up and taking off these aircrafts. Here I am today sharing the good news with you guys, maybe confusing you some, <laughs> but I'm here. And to see the Lord's hand in all of this, it's a, it's a trip. And I know every one of you has similar stories. That's my story. But we all have our own stories that, how did I get here? And I think it's not a coincidence. The Lord put you here. The Lord is guiding you. His Holy Spirit continues to guide you all. Wherever you're at, wherever your health is, Ernie, the Lord is still guiding you uh, at, at all of our points of life. Uh, today and um, military strategy and wisdom and all of this is part of of what he has for us. Yes. The example that you just gave in terms of your Arlen. life, uh, I'd like to compare that just a minute with what it says here. Uh, it would be like verse nineteen. Uh, so, uh, so David inquired of the Lord, "Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me?" The Lord answered him, go for I will surely hand him over to you. 
Now that sound, when I read this on the surface, it sounds to me like, uh, you know, uh, he asks the question, then he hears God's voice and he follows it. But the point I'm trying to get at is, I don't think you, in the same world today, and God's the same as he was then. Now you, what happened to you, you went along with the flow. Saul, God spoke to him too, but not necessarily where you can hear the words. And if you don't like what God wants for you, you can reject it. So, so I, I, I just, does that make sense? Yeah. So do you see people having the ability to reject God in the world? Do you see evidence of that? Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right, Arlen. Um, we, we have the ability to reject, and we do it a lot. Well, the reason I bring it up is, if you read you know, the Old Testament, just as we're going through it, God, they ask the question of God, God answers in various ways, but uh, answers. But if you look at the last 2,000 years, if you read the Bible and think that God was speaking to you, and you could have tape recorded it if you had a tape recorder, I think it's the wrong attitude, because... Right now, if you ask people, you know, from the time Jesus was here and when he departed, God's involvement in this world, is that I think in the public, he was going just right straight downhill. But that's because, well, as one of the uh, uh, theologians of whose book I read recently, he said, God has a message for us every day, for everyone. But you have to have an open heart and an open mind to receive it and how do we get that open heart and that open mind we stop rejecting the Holy Spirit is working on all of you guys and ladies the Holy Spirit is steadily working on you and Luther would say we have we don't have the ability to receive we only have the ability to reject as soon as we stop rejecting, it's it's lavished upon us. The doors open, the food is prepared and given to us, the it's put inside us, the whole thing. But yes, we do have the ability to reject a uh, him. That's what happened in the garden. They wanted to be like God, and they were in effect rejecting him, taking the fruit, uh, not trusting him. Wanting to be like God. You're absolutely right, Arlen. Um, and that's what we see going on in the world. What I like in our text, if we go back uh, to verse, the end of verse 19, uh, the Lord said to David, go up for I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. So God says, do it, David. Verse 20, what does David do? David came to Baal Perasim and David defeated them there. How did David defeat them? Do you think David walked in and said, hey, guys, God's on our side. Lay your stuff down. What do we think happened there? David defeated them. Somebody tell me what happened. And what happened? And what else happened? I mean, Give me a, a illustration here. What what do we think happened there? I would think it would have been a route. A route. Yeah. Meaning, what happened to the enemy? Killed them. It was horrible. It was rotten. It was slicing and dicing and like uh, uh, that movie Braveheart. How many of you guys saw Braveheart? It, it's a long time ago, right? It came out. I mean, you think of those guys in battle and they're fighting and they're stabbing and everybody's got blood all over and they're fighting. That's what happened out there. Okay, the Lord said, I'm with you. Go do it. And it was a bloodbath, right? I mean, literally. Okay, so immediately following that, back to our text, David defeated them. Okay, so he wins, right? And you got old... Uh, not Rusty Wallace. What was his first name? Uh, in Braveheart. William. William Wallace. Freedom! Right? 
at the very end? So, well, Sir William Wallace, uh, he defeats them all. And so what is, uh, and he said, being David, immediately, the Lord has burst through my enemies before me like a bursting flood. What's David doing? The Lord has burst through me, through my enemy. I'm sorry. The Lord has burst through my enemies before me like a bursting flood. What does that say in our language? Kevin. Yeah. He's given God the credit. How much credit? Right? I am certain they lost some guys. And I am certain they're covered with blood. And they've had this horrible battle and they're exhausted. And his guys are exhausted. And all of this. The Lord doesn't just say, okay, because you're my guy. Hey, everybody else fall over and, you know. No. They had to fight the battle. And immediately following it, David says, uh, again, in verse 20, the Lord has burst through my enemies before me like a bursting flood. Therefore, the name is Baal Perazim. And the Philistines left their idols there, and David and his men carried them away. Why did he carry their idols away? What did he do with them? Destroy them. Destroy the idols. Why? Because the Lord of the heavens and the earth is in front of us. The Lord did all of this. And he basically uh, worked through us, but it's all the Lord. And it's, it's the Lord receives the glory because the Lord is the one who's driving the ship. And the Lord is the one who gets the credit. This is powerful. This is this earthiness in David. We look at change a lot in the world. But I would submit this, guys. We don't have a Lord of change. We have a Lord of growth. And when you look at where you're at in your lives, you didn't go through a lot of changes, and that's what got you here. You went through growth. Growth is what got you where you're at today. It may have been painful sometimes. I'm not saying it wasn't. But we have a Lord of growth, and that's what he's doing in David. Mike Coles, going back to your question back two months ago, or however long ago it was, why was David not given the kingship when he was anointed, when he was the shepherd boy? He wasn't ready, and we have a God of growth. God was not, David was not ready yet. God was working with him. David was ready to, to go on the docks and load the trucks. David was not ready to be the CEO of the trucking company yet. He had to learn what it was to load the trucks, unload the trucks, maybe drive the truck, right? <clears throat> go to the other end, learn what it means to, to have a manifest and how many widgets are on this, how many pallets. Uh, how do I get the pallets off of here? David, you got to coordinate a forklift. Okay, I got to get the forklift. He's learning all of these tools all the way along before he can be the CEO. Now David's the CEO. We have a Lord of growth. And that is what we, that's what we can cling to, guys. Because all of this with David is leading us where? That's where, where he's leading us to. The God of growth. One typology. <clears throat> David, looking to one greater than David. One greater being the Savior who will give his life for who? For everybody. A God of growth. And that's what he's doing in your lives is he's building you and growing you and growing those around you and preparing you to take the message to more and more and more people. You are more. You may not be more so confident in sharing God's message today, but I can assure you, you're more confident today than you were five years ago. The Lord is growing you and he's growing me and we see evidence of that around us the world around us it's got its challenges as you mentioned arlen uh rejecting rejecting steadily rejecting the word um but patience intact that's the thing in the seminary they said if you want to make it as a pastor and i'd say if you want to make it as a leader in the church the two qualities you have to have and 
Ron, you visit with a lot of people. Patience and tact is what you have to take out there with them. And as they said in the seminary, patience and tact, patience and tact. And to that I say, the Lord has blessed me with many things, but me personally, I don't have a whole lot of patience, and I certainly don't have a whole lot of tact. However, to no avail, uh, I'm, wor I'm working on that. I'm working on that. He's using me in spite of that. <laughs> okay, let's get back to our text. All right. Hey, knock it off. We gotta hurry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so let's move on. I don't know why you guys you, you take me to dark places, guys. I'm trying here. All right. <clears throat> Chapter six. Um, all right, let me uh, jump in here and see if I can rattle through a little of this. All right, chapter 6, verse 1. <clears throat> so David's walking with the Lord, right? Verse 1, David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, about 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up uh, from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. Verse 3. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. Verse 5. And David and all the house of Israel were making merry before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. Verse 6. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Usa put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uza, and God struck him down there because of his error. And he died there beside the ark of of God. Verse 8. And David was angry because the Lord had burst forth against Uzzah. Okay, let me repeat that verse again. David was angry because the Lord had burst forth against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. Verse 9. And David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David. But David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Verse 11, And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, uh, the Gittite, three months. And the Lord blessed uh, Obed-Edom and all his household. Verse 12, And it was told King David, it was told King David, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of the Lord of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. Okay, a lot going on there. All right, so going back to the beginning here of chapter 6. So David gathers his merry men, about 30,000, um, and they go to Baal Judah. Why? For, the, for one purpose, and that's to bring up uh, the Ark of God, which is called by the name of Lord of Hosts, who sits on the cherubim. So then verse 3, they carried the Ark of God on a new cart. Why a new cart? No trick question. Why new? Why why a brand new cart? Maybe show yeah, right? Show reverence. That's kind of a nice thing, right? And brought it out of the house of Abinadab. Remember, it was in that house for some 30 years, uh, which is on the hill. 
And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, okay, so these guys are priests, were driving the new cart uh, uh, with the Ark of God, and Ahio went before the Ark. So here they are. They got the Ark on the cart. It's bouncing along in this wagon. It's brand new. Nothing has ever been in it before. And David and the house of Israel were making merry before the Lord. They're singing. They're happy. Everything is going great. Uh, and then what happens to the ark? You guys who move furniture around, you put it in the back of trucks. What happened to the ark? It was falling, right? Falling out the back or falling out the side. Falling somewhere. This guy, Usa, uh, in verse 6, puts out his hand to the ark, took a hold of it because the, the, the oxen stumbles. And then the anger of God was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him there because of his error, and he died before the Lord. So why, if they had a nice cart, brand new, um, they got the cart in there, why was Usa killed? Why did God <coughs> do that to him? Because we see in the next verse, how's David respond? David's ticked. He's angry with God. Have you ever been angry with God? Any of you? Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll put that out on the table. Let's go back to our question and we'll come back to that. Why then was Usa killed? What was the mistake? He touched the ark. Oh, sorry, Mark. You told me I shouldn't blow my nose on the camera. Ah. Uh, God never instructed him to move the ark by far. He gave his goal specifically to carrying the ark. That's the deal. Remember, I'm glad one of you was listening when I spent two weeks going through all of those slides. With the rings, remember, and all that. God gave them, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> it was laborious, right? When we read through that stuff, and this was laden in gold, and, this was a, and they got the two rings, and they put the poles through the rings, and the guys are supposed to carry this, and all this. God gave them instructions, specific instructions on how they were to move him, move his ark, and move the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle. The original tabernacle is it's gone now, but we have the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark, what's in the Ark? Three things. The commandments. Manna. And Aaron's staff, right? That the weeds came out of or whatever, right? And that's what's inside it. So they put it on this new cart. That was a nice thing to do. God was specific, and he told them, this is how you will move the God of hosts around. You will carry him. I have designed this thing a specific way. I've given you instructions on how to do this. I've given you instructions uh, in this book on how you should live and how you should walk with the Lord. My word is my word. Going back to our earlier discussion, my word is still my word. We don't know what got them there or what Uzzah, we don't have all of the background on Uzzah and who he was as a priest, but he certainly wasn't, he wasn't a Levite. And so he didn't have the authority to carry this thing, certainly not to touch it. And so what we have here is going back to the Philistines, the Philistines and their traditions they moved everything around by wagon. They moved everything around, uh, you know, with uh, you know, two men in a truck. Those were the Philistines, not the Lord's people. The Lord and his people, he had them as a mobile people. He had them as a, a people that were uh, going to uh, move this thing. When, when the Lord says move, the uh, pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. You guys remember all that, right? And the Lord is going to say he wants his people mobile. He did not want them to put him in the back of a truck like the stinking Philistines did. 
and you went back to the Philistines' traditions, not what the Lord said in his word. And so, um, and we don't know the backstory of what got Usa there or what who's done or how they got it in the truck and the but the lord made it clear no my word is my word i'm a loving caring his proper work is love his alien work is anger and judgment and usa found out that day the lord is not to be messed with questions I don't like that. I, I don't like that story, to be honest with you. I, there are certain stories, and like that's one of them. Uh, I just, you know, they, again, in my sense of uh, right and wrong in so many ways, they put them in a new cart and they uh, did all these things, uh, but they did not follow his word. Why? You know, he said, do it this way. Yeah. 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 Maybe I, I should have known better. Yeah. I should have known better. Yeah. I don't think he was paying attention. And uh, what was he doing at that moment? Uh, Help Sam out. Anybody? He was dancing. He's having a good time. He's celebrating. Celebrating the Lord, but he took his eye off the ball. You're right, Sam. I've had employees like that. <laughs> They became USA. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you're in, um, again, I'm a product of uh, two parents that worked in factories. Uh, my wife, her dad uh, retired as uh, executive vice president of the ball corporation, you know, the ball canning jars. And uh, he was in the can container division. He opened up a plant. They were in Virginia. Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia, they opened a plant in uh, Conroe, Texas. Going just before you get to Houston, you opened a plant there, and that's where we met down there. But I've regressed again. But um, in his canning plant, if somebody is asleep at the wheel and they're out there with that machinery, what happens to them, Sam? Well, well their, their hand will be gone, right? I mean, if they're, if they're not paying attention and you're on this machinery – You'll lose a finger or a hand, and that machine don't care. It'll be going like that, right? Uh, you got to keep your eye on the ball. You got to keep your eye on the ball. And uh, the Lord wants you to keep your eye on the ball. He's serious about his word. He is loving. He's caring. I'm going to walk with you. But he's serious about his word. Deadly serious. Deadly serious. Um, you know, it's not a great message in church sometimes, and um, a lot of people ask, well, where's, where's God's judgment? You know, where's, here's God showing his judgment. Um, I'm not to be messed with. I love you. I'll walk with you, but you are not God. You know, remember your place and, uh, you are precious in my eyes, but, uh, don't cross that line. They did. And Usa paid. So David, now this is an interesting, something I picked up reading the text uh, in verse 10. David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to the city of David, but instead he took it uh, to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. Now, they, why didn't David want to take it to Jerusalem, the ark of the covenant? Why did he not want to take it there? Yeah, right? Yeah. How would you like to be Obed in the get tight? I'm going to put this. Okay, here's the deal. <clears throat> All right? 
I got these uh, five people that got COVID-19. I don't want them in our town because they can affect our town. But we're going to put them here in your town. <laughs> or better yet, in your house. Right? Or your nursing home. <laughs> or in your nursing home. Let's not get political here. It happens. It happens, right? Does history repeat itself? You're a historian. Does history repeat itself over and over and over again, right? But yeah, that's what's going on here. Who did David not inquire of before he put the ark and Obed Edom's, the Gittite, in his house? Who did he not inquire of? I thought it was of God. He didn't inquire of God. He just said, he was ticked off, and he said, okay, we're going to put that thing there. So three months later, what happens to the house of Obed-Edom? He flourishes. Great things are happening. The Lord is blessing them. David goes back, and David gets the, uh, the ark. He brings it uh, to, um, to Jerusalem or to Zion. Verse 14, David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting, with the sound of the horn. So it's uh, I get I get the visions of like, you know, in Revelation with John talking about the trumpets blowing, you know, the Lord. And I just I, I think the imagery here is awesome. But here David is in our text. David is wearing a linen ephod. So which is basically a, just a kind of a, a linen thing, right? I mean, like basically underwear. And, uh, but he's got the, the ephod on it, um, and uh, he's dancing along the way. Why is he wearing the linen ephod? What's, what would he, who is David right now? What is his job? He's king. King of what? King of the whole thing, right? What should he normally be wearing? Okay, he's not in battle. So a king, if you're in battle, okay, you know, like old Sean Connery put the hat on and all this stuff, right? The chingadet is hanging everywhere. And you're, you're ready to go into battle, right? When you're not in battle, you wear your crown. You're, yeah, your crown, your royal robes, you wear all this stuff, and you're the guy, right? <clears throat> What's David wearing? Linen ephod. Who wears a linen ephod? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So he's wearing this priestly robe, and but he's not, and it's very simple. But he's not wearing his his gar his crown or his robes. He's not wearing these things. Why? What's what's David doing here? Or, or. It's undignified, so like he was not humble himself. Makes sense to me. That's exactly what he was doing, right? This is what makes David David. This is why David is awesome. David is as at one with God. David is given. Again, he did the old uh, William Wallace thing. He went into battle, fought all those guys, did all that stuff, lost some of his guys, um, put his, his butt out there, all of that, paid homage to God. It's all about God. He's bringing this thing back in complete relationship with God. <clears throat> and he is humbling himself before the Lord and get paying homage, giving the Lord all the credit for all the Lord has done. David is looking at all of his life, and he's seeing this seven years of being king of Judah. Now he's the king of the whole thing. He saw the two years of you know being in Ziklag before that, and he saw the, what, seven years of, of being in uh, roaming around and the, all those years of being chased by uh, Saul and um, his time as a shepherd boy and Goliath and all of this, all of this stuff, he is connect. David is connecting the dots, and David is saying, 
it was all God. And God is, he is the bomb. It's all God. And God, not only is God all powerful, all knowing the creator of all things, he is in relationship with me and my people. That's what David is saying. We can't lose. We've got, you know, like back to the future, right? We got the, the betting book. We got the book with all the scores and the games that haven't even played yet. You know, the, and that's where David is at. And it, it's all about God. And I can't lose no matter what happens in the future. I can't lose. And it's all because of God. That is where David is at. We need to remain. We're going to stop there in the text. We'll pick up on verse 16. Um, next. We'll see how it's what David is doing. But again, David is leading us to Christ. And what did Christ do? He gave his blood to pay for the forgiveness of our sins, to make us whole with him. And gentlemen and ladies, that is where we are at today. We're in this life, this thing where we see death all around us. And I know some of you guys have just recently dealt with death. Um, and we've got, you know, Marlene Dreyer, who's walking through us now, with Roger uh, passing away. Next week, Monday, by the way, his service will be here Monday at 4 o'clock uh, in the Fine Arts Center. An email will come out on this. But so there's a lot of hard things. A lot of our, you guys, your health, it's going down and your families are hurting. All of these things. Life is hard. And you guys know life is hard. <clears throat> but in all of this, what David is telling us is there's one better coming. That's been Christ. The one better is coming. But we trust that, that we know the, st with the story. And so we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to be scared of, of the, the nitwits in Washington. We don't have to be scared of COVID. We don't have to be you know, scared of the power going out. Uh, will it be uncomfortable? Will it be bad? Will it be, yeah, okay, yeah. Was it uh, when David went out and he fought the Philistines and they're slicing and diced and dicing like our friend William Wallace? Was that bad? Of course it was. But in all of it, David is saying, my salvation is in the Lord and my salvation is secure. And that's the truth that we have, that we walk in. And that is the message that the rest of the world needs to hear, no matter how things look. And I don't care what the stock market is doing or any of this junk or if they're burning down stinking Portland. In all of this, the Lord still has his people in his grip, just like he had David all that time. And guys, as believers, should sleep well at night. No matter what station of life you're in, you should sleep well at night knowing that the Lord has you in his grip. That is why David is so awesome. He gives us that and he's earthy and he's a mess sometimes. And we're going to see him make more mistakes because you guys are all going to make more mistakes. And you out there too are going to make more mistakes and I'm going to make mistakes and I'm going to do things I will regret. But in all of it, our Lord says, I will walk with you and I will never leave you nor. Yes. In Jesus name. Amen. Let us pray. We're out of time. Lord God, heavenly father, we thank you for bringing us here this day. We thank you for, are reminding us <clears throat> through David uh, how precious your people are in your sight and how you grab a hold of them and you walk with them and care for them and continue to provide. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray as we walk from this place today that we have the courage of David to walk out of here, no matter how things may look, that we can walk and sing and dance and play the cymbals and the lyres and the, the blow the horns in knowing the truth of your word, that your son gave his life for our salvation, and our salvation is secure in your name. And the world, no matter who they are, can't take it away from us. We pray that your Holy Spirit allows us to take that message out and share it. Put people in front of us this week, Lord, that we can share that message with and give us the courage to share the good news of your son, Jesus Christ. And we ask you, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us what it means to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. Oh, here, let me turn this around so you can see all the guys here today. Hey, you see there? Hey, here's David's. There's Arlen over there. All right. And here are all the cookies that came. So love you guys. We'll see you same place, same time next week. Have a great week. Love you guys. Bye. Yeah, yeah.